Okay, this is lecture 38 in Zoo 3649, uh, and this is the exciting lecture of phylogeography. This is um, <coughs> what a lot of us started our careers doing, uh, looking at the interface where genes meet geography. Okay, and many an honors, masters, and PhD student has done projects, their honors, their, their masters or projects, their, all their projects were uh, phylogeography projects. So phylogeography is something that uh, uh, we do on quite a number of species as a natural part of our research. So it's the interface, as I said, where genes meet geography. So I'm just going to explain to you what is phylogeography. It's the study of the historical processes that are responsible for the geographic distribution uh, of organisms. So the current day contemporary geographic distribution of organisms. When you look at, for example, wildebeests or uh, rhinos or roan antelope or even humans. Why are there humans in different parts of the world? What, are the, what is the genetics of the humans in the different parts of the world? Can we look at the genetics, make trees for the genes, and figure out what historical processes led to humans being uh, distributed in a certain way across the world? So genes are very uh, important in this, and we rely it relies heavily on producing trees from genes, taking a gene and producing a tree or a gene genealogy. And this is why I explained a lot to you about gene genealogies, species trees, gene trees, when species trees and gene trees don't uh, match up, how we use the coalescent process to assume, to um, infer a species tree from many different gene trees. So that is because most of these studies are phylogeographic studies. They want to figure out what processes, what historical evolutionary processes led to the current day situation. Okay? Uh, why are s uh, certain animals found in certain populations with certain alleles? Okay? And based on those alleles, we can trace back the evolution of these populations and figure out what happened to lead to the evolution of these populations. And that is our aim. And so to do that, we need to take genes, sequence them, and produce trees out of them. Okay? So a gene gene genealogy, a tree, is the relationship of the different alleles at one particular homologous locus. And we know it's homologous because we use PCR to um, amplify the same gene in several different in individuals, which we sequence, and then we align them with each other. Right? And the alignment is very important for homology because we need to make sure that each site that we compare is a homologous site. Okay, Because we remember, we, we must have homologous sites. We can't make a tree from something which is not homologous. Otherwise, we're going to make the wrong tree. Remember, if we use analogous characters to make a tree, we're going to get the wrong tree. Okay? And once we make the tree, we map this tree, this genealogy, onto the geographic distributions and see what relationships there are and what relationships we can explain. Okay, so the early attempts of phylogeography were by a guy, an American guy named John Avis in 1987. And this uh, was early work, but it was very descriptive, so very narrative. It, 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 it described patterns, but it did not statistically test these patterns or alternative patterns. So it was criticized for that reason. Then a guy named Alan Templeton came along with something called a nested clade analysis, which basically took gene genealogies and um, how clade, how the clades look. So whether it's one big clade or whether there's several clades nested inside the, the big clade. And he um, developed a key of inference to say if the gene, the gene genealogy looks in a certain way, then it is due to dispersal. If the gene genealogy looks in a certain, in a different way, then it is due to vicariance or uh, one or other of the um, historical events could be inferred from Templeton's nested clade analysis. So this was a little bit more uh, statistically rigorous. But unfortunately, nested clade analysis also had its drawbacks. 
Um, and r what we've done recently is, yes, the clever ones of you have already guessed it, the recent um, uh, methods we are now using have to do with the coalescent, okay? Mm -hmm. And so the coalescent methods, as you know, bring populations together with trees, and so we can estimate the tree and the branching pattern, the gene genealogy, simultaneously with changes in population size going back in time. So we can figure out demography, the population genetics, and the branching genealogy, the relationships at the same time. And these are much more statistically um, rigorous approaches. So these are the recent approaches, the coalescent approaches that I'm talking about at the bottom there. Okay, that's what we're using presently. And so what kind of signatures have we been able to detect uh, based on past historical events? Well, one of the main historical events that happened, you guys were not around to see it. I was not around to see it. We are both, we are all too young for that. But it occurred during what we call the last glacial maximum. About 26,000 years ago, the earth didn't look like the way it did. Okay, the earth was under an ice age. It was very, very cold. And during ice ages, what happens is that areas become cold and very grassy or frozen. Okay, what happens to forests? Forests become restricted to very, very few areas on the tropical belt. Okay, and so trop uh, forests get small, uh, the earth gets drier not so wet anymore during an ice age all the ice is frozen all the moisture is frozen so the earth becomes dry and full of grass or in the northern and southern areas completely frozen in the middle areas full of grass and in the very middle a few forests okay what happens during uh, an interglacial in other words uh, the opposite of an ice age a warm period which is like what we are in today uh, then you have forests getting bigger, the earth getting warmer, forests getting bigger, and grasslands getting smaller. Okay, and so it's important to realize that the earth's climate was not the same as what it is today in the past. The earth climate has been changing, okay? And so what we call that, that climate from the old days is the paleo climate, okay? So you know what the climate is? The climate is basically the changes in weather over time right well the paleoclimate is the changes in weather over evolutionary time geological time okay so in ancient history and we know what the paleoclimate is because we're able to core down to the center close getting down into the earth and looking at layers of mud and sedimentation that go back thousands hundreds of thousands of years and what species were alive in those layers and from what species were alive and the amount of oxygen isotopes the ratio of oxygen uh, isotopes in their shells tells you how long they've been dead okay and it then it gives the layer of that um, mud horizon that you've caught into the earth it gives it a date so we can tell what was happening what the temperature etc was going backwards in time people are very clever all right so how and we know that the climate was that's how we know that we, there was an ice age right because we figured out that these the climate has been changing rapidly uh, with past time so the earth has undergone thousands of different changes in climate okay and so for example uh, 26,000 years ago during the last ice age this is what Europe looked like. Okay, here's a map of Europe. So some of you who don't even know that this is Europe, it's time to uh, it's time to put your thinking caps on. This is now third year. You have to know that this is Europe. If you don't know this is Europe, you don't deserve to be in third year, quite frankly. Okay, so this is a map of Europe. And what is different about this map? You see, th this is not a map of contemporary Europe today. This map shows you ice. All of Northern Europe here, this is now what is called Russia, and this is Scandinavian Peninsula. This is part of Germany here, okay? Most of Central and Northern Europe was what? It was frozen under ice, okay? Nobody or animal could live there. England, here are the British Isles here, England and Ireland. Most of England is also frozen by ice. So this areas here, which are not frozen, were very cold grasslands. And only these areas here that are green had some forests. This was 26,000 years ago. 
So what do you think happened to the animals during that time? Were they living in the same way they're doing now all over Europe? If you, in case you don't know, there are, yes, there are animals living all over Europe. Europe is a very wild place. If you don't know that, please, you don't deserve to be in third year zoology. Okay? It doesn't matter what part of the world it is. You have to know about it. You have to, you have to have this in science. If you don't have this, it's not going to work for you. Okay? So, uh, in Europe today, contemporary Europe, animals are running around everywhere. But in these days, during the Ice Age, it wasn't like that. Okay? This Ice Age was during the Pleistocene period. From 12 to 2.4, 12,000 years ago to 2.4 million years ago. And the peak of the last glacial maximum, the last one, was 26,000 years ago. So, inside this period. Okay? And so, what happens is that the climate in, in, induces a massive selection pressure, as I've said. Okay? Because uh, um, areas that were forested get smaller and fragmented. Areas that were grassland become bigger, and when the climate changes and becomes warmer, what happens? Then the opposite happens. The grasslands get smaller and the forests get bigger. So if you are an animal adapted to a grassland or a forest, what is going to happen to your population size during the, um, the, the Pleistocene? It's going to go up and down, up and down, depending on whether you are specializing into grasslands whether you're speci specializing to forests. All right. And so what happened? You f the, 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 the populations had to adapt to the changes, right? If you don't adapt, adapt, you have to move to a suitable area. So all the animals that were living here, in, which is, had slowly become frozen, they had to move into the south where the temperature was still a bit warmer and where they still had some forests. If there were forests up here, those animals could not survive there anymore. They had to move into the forest here, and if they down south, where this green area is, and if they didn't manage to do that, they adapted, okay? They became more adapted to cold environments, grew maybe thicker fur or something to survive up in the north. If they couldn't do that, they had to move to the south. And if they didn't move or adapt, what would happen? They would simply die. Okay, and that's what happened when the climate changed in the past. And so that is why several species living in interglacial Europe were forced to move to warmer parts down here, down in the south, towards the equator. Warmer parts in the south during glacial periods. And during these glacial periods, these cold periods, these warmer areas were known as glacial refugia. Okay, so they, had, they took refuge. The animals were escaping the ice. They took refuge in these glacial refugia. And, in, and in, in Europe, there are several glacial refugia. The Iberian Peninsula, uh, which is now called Spain and Portugal, that was a, a glacial refuge. Uh, the uh, Italian Peninsula, this is Italy here, uh, was also a glacial, glacial refuge. The Balkan Peninsula here, the Balkans here. Also Turkey, the Anatolian Peninsula, uh, was also a glacial refuge so four different glacial refugia in Europe at least four okay so what are the genetic signatures of these paleoclimatic events mm -hmm. so in other words what I'm saying is phylogeography wants to recreate the historical events that look that resulted in the gene trees or genetic signatures so what we want to know is what genetic signatures did the paleoclimatic ice age event create what did that historical event create okay how did the changing climate affect the genetic structure okay so in general ranges as i explained to you in a population during a population in bottlenecks so um if the if if, you, if the population was used to being in a, a forest area then during the ice age the forest become fragmented and very small what happens to the population it also becomes fragmented and very small no gene flow between the populations and becomes very fragmented very small and and what happens the population bottlenecks when we say bottleneck it means this population goes from a big size into like the neck of a bottle where it goes it gets constricted into a thin small size it goes from a big size to a small size that's what we mean by population bottleneck or population contraction okay so so then what happens then after the bottleneck when the climate change changes and now the popular the 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 
forest becomes bigger and expands, what happens to the population? They also start expanding. They also start getting bigger. And they also start migrating between populations. And so many genetic studies find the genetic signatures of both animal and plants that supports a scenario of refugia and expo uh, during glaciation. So during the ice age, a refuge in a refugia. And then after the ice age, a rapid expansion. And for example, you look at this map of Europe, here are these, in the people have sampled in the Iberian, in the Balkans, and in, um, in uh, Iran, in the Anatolian area, and they've taken genes from these three areas here, and they've looked at them, and each of these areas has a distinct genetic haplotype, okay? And if you look at the genes, it shows you that there are few of these, very, see these big circles? They are uh, the, the, the size, there are lots of different circles in this, in this network here. It's a haplotype network. And, in, and, and the little circles mean that, that means that that sequence or haplotype is shared by few individuals. And a big circle like this means that the haplotype is shared by many individuals. So in this study here, we're looking at one gene, okay, but sequenced in hundreds and hundreds of individuals. And you can see that there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight main haplotypes that most individuals belong to one of those eight. But there are other, lots of them, haplotypes which only one or two or three individuals belong to. Okay, and when you see a pattern like this, where you have one, uh, com several common haplotypes, but lots of different haplotypes which are very closely related to that common haplotype. You see here, this is the common haplotype, and this haplotype here, for example, is one mutation different to that one. And this haplotype here is one mutation different to that, and so on. So all these other haplotypes, these minor haplotypes here, are re closely related to the main haplotype by one mutation. Okay, And you see here that what would happen in a refuge where there's no gene flow and the population size is small? Only individuals, all the individuals become one haplotype because what happens genetic drift is hammering that population and eventually you'll only get one maybe two haplotypes surviving in that population okay and remember when you're talking about haplotypes mitochondrial dna genetic drift is much harder on mitochondrial dna it sorts into these species specific monophyletic plates much quicker than other kinds of dna so you'll have in genetic drift causing these haplotypes to become very common in the population and then what happens the population, the ice age ends, the uh, forests get bigger, the population can expand. And then what happens? You have this expansion here, this classical star-shaped uh, um, star network where you have a couple of common haplotypes and lots of other haplotypes that are very closely related. And those haplotypes evolved when? During the expansion phase. So now the expanding population size is getting bigger and lots and lots and lots of new haplotypes, which are very closely related to the central haplotype, the, the main haplotype. Lots of them evolve. And this is a classical picture here of, a, of evolution uh, in isolation. That is how these main haplotypes evolve in these different refugia here. That's, and then expansion out after the end of the last ice age, expansion out of these refugia in, and the evolution of lots of these very, uh, very closely related haplotypes to the main haplotypes and only one or two mutations different. So very closely related to the main haplotype, but only evolving since the last ice age, since the expansion started. Okay, so this is how, this is how we use a gene genealogy to figure out what happened the historical events that happened back in time because this gene genealogy when you look at it here is telling you only one story it's telling you that populations in in europe went into these refugia contracted genetic bottleneck high genetic drift and then the ice age ended and then they expanded again and then that's how these other minor haplotypes around here evolved during the expansion phase so you see how useful a gene tree is a gene genealogy a network like this can tell us what happened in the past in that population and not only can we see that happening in Europe we see that happening in our own co continent Africa because we our species 
comes from Africa. After we left Africa, what did we do? We arrived in Europe about 40,000 years ago. Okay, this green arrow shows how we arrived in Europe 40,000 years ago. And then we were living all over Europe. Then what happened? And our, our, our history is exactly the same as the history of these other species in Europe. Because our, our history in Europe follows was exactly at the time of the last glacial maximum. So 40,000 years ago, humans arrived. 26,000 years ago, there was a last glacial maximum. So things got very cold. It was all icy in Europe, and humans can't live in ice. So they all came into, at around 26 to 18,000 years, they came into these red refugia here. All humans lived in these three populations, in Iberia, in the Italian peninsula, and in the Balkans. Okay, and, and from there, they stayed there isolated until the end of the last glacial maximum. And about 10,000 years ago, what happened? They expanded again. More humans came in from the Middle East and the humans expanded out of the glacial maxima, uh, m uh, the glacial refugia back into Northern Europe. So humans have exact in Europe have exactly the same um, patterns of phylogeography that other species do. Now, what about Africa? Okay, you see the African continent was not the same during the last glacial maximum. Look at today's African continent, okay? Look at the yellow here. The yellow is the grassland. Look at the grassland in the north is not connected to the grassland in the south. Look at how big the forests are. This green here are the forests. They are massive forests in Central and West Africa, some in the Ethiopian highlands and some in high altitude forests in the Kenyan highlands. And so this is what the Earth looks like today. But 26,000 years ago, during the last glacial maximum, the last ice age, Africa looked different. For those of you who do not have eyes, they look the same. But for those of you who have eyes and are observant, you will see what the grassland has become continuous. So the grassland was continuous 26,000 years ago in Africa. Okay, so you would have had continuous grazing populations from South Africa all the way into West Africa, which you do not have today, okay? Because the grasslands are not continuous today. The populations are fragmented. Grassland populations are fragmented. And look at here, look at here, the forests. Look how small they were during the last glacial maximum. Why? Because the earth was drier, okay? And so forests contracted into tiny little places. Okay, tiny little places. Okay, and so there was a last glacial maximum, they were contracted, and then we had a very warm period, seven after the last glacial maximum, around seven and a half thousand years ago. And what happened is this picture changed to this picture here. In fact, look at this here. The grassland is completely covering what is now today the Sahara Desert. Okay, it was a Sahara Desert during the Ice Age. It's a Sahara des Desert today. But seven and a half thousand years ago, it was completely grass covered. So you see how different Africa has become since the last glacial maximum and today. We went from there to there and look how connected the forest is in Africa. There's no West Africa and Central. It's all connected. Okay, so <coughs> during today's times, and during the last glacial maximum, you could, you could hypothesize that that, um, indiv that species living in these forests would become isolated, and genetic drift would fragment them into different populations, compared to seven thousand five hundred years ago, when there was probably gene flow connecting all the forest populations, and no genetic drift, and so no uh, differentiation into different populations. So these paleoclimatic changes in our own continent would have given rise to a lot of genetic signatures, okay? So what are, and we look at these patterns uh, by mapping the gene trees of many species and looking for general patterns, okay? And this looking for general patterns is what we call comparative phylogeography. Why? Because it's not looking at the phylogeography of one species like humans or rhinos or elephants or deer or antelopes. No, it's looking at many different species and looking for the patterns. 
okay and that's how we look at, and then we, we, we see similar patterns we can say ah the same geographic the same historical the same evolutionary events could have shaped these different species okay so we see um, the similarities in the patterns of different species and we can infer what historical or evolutionary events caused those patterns okay so if we see concordance so the same pattern in different taxa we can uh, clarify uh, uh, what events caused those patterns okay um, also paleogeographic data okay is what we need for paleo means from a long time ago so we need also data that tells us uh, from fossils that tells us what was occurring when in the old times not just what is occurring uh, today okay and so we use a combination of techniques both ancient data looking at gene trees species trees and we look at different species and we test for patterns of common influence that is the key when it comes to comparative phylogeography so look at these patterns here's a map of africa here's uh, different species mapped onto a map of africa you have giraffe um, buffalo bushbuck this is actually a study that i did when i was a very young scientist in 20, 2007 and you see here it's been used uh, in in this comparative study by another author um, and uh, this is a study of waterbuck here this is a study of waterbuck spotted hyena cheetah warthog and um, hartebeest and what can you see in sub-saharan africa okay what can you see that the Sahara Desert represents a physically and ecologically heterogeneous region south of the Sahara. So nothing really happening north of the Sahara in any of these species, except maybe the cheetah here. Okay, But what we have in these species is we have continental scale west and north or east-south patterns. So here is a pattern, for example, see this south south here and east south 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 and east why do all these these species and they're different species to each other why do all of these mammal species show the southeast pattern and west north western and the northern west north west north west north why do they both show why do all these species show these and the lines, the circles or the ellipses here are circling these genetic groups, different genetic groups in the west and the north compared to the south and the east. Why do all these species show the same pattern? Why? Because they're separated by something here. Something is separating all these species from each other along this axis of Africa. What do you think it is? They are two different things. Who's the clever people? Who are the clever people in this module? Okay, it's the African Rift, which starts in Ethiopia and goes all the way down through East Africa. Okay, petering out in the Okavango down here in South Africa. So that rift separates East from West, but also lying right in the middle here, in the middle of Central Africa, is the Congo rainforest. Okay, so the rainforest, all these species are living outside the rainforest. Not one is living in the rainforest. And so the rainforest plus the rift of Africa together create this pattern where genetics is different in the north and the west and in the south and the east. The patterns are different because of the common feature of the African rift and the Congo basin keeping those grazing so or keeping those non-congo non-forest species keeping them separate genetic entities and you see then how geography climate um the african rift the earth pushing the earth pushing up rifts or pushing down valleys when the continents come together all those processes can lead to genetic patterns okay and that's the beauty of phylogeography to look at the genes figure out the pattern and then g find a reason why that pattern is existing what did, was the earth doing to create this pattern 
okay and like all other species humans are no example okay so humans humans have our own phylogeographic story like like buffalo like warthog like bushbuck human have their own and um before we had enough data we had two competing hypotheses for human phylogeography and again ladies and gentlemen this if you look at past exams this is a past exam question okay what are the two competing hypotheses of human phylogeography and how has this how have have these hypotheses been shaped by new data okay please expect a question like that okay you've seen it in, appearing in several exams in the past so maybe it will occur this year as well okay so we had two competing hypotheses for human and it's and and, and it, if you try to memorize this you will get it wrong in the exam okay you will get i promise you like every year you will get it wrong like every year Okay, so if you try to memorize without understanding this, you will mess it up, right? So please try to understand what's going on. Um, so if we look at um, before DNA, okay, we looked at um, skulls, fossil, skeletal remains, okay, of human remains. We estimated their age across the world, and it led to uh, the first hypothesis. Um, which I'm actually going to uh, talk about second. I'm going to talk about the multi-regional hypothesis first because it makes sense to talk about it first. So, before any kind of human left Africa, humans were in Africa first. And the first kind of modern, well, the first kind of human-like animal, upright walking ape, to leave Africa was Homo ergaster. Okay, and Homo ergaster lived in Africa around two million years ago. And Homo ergaster left Africa uh, in a population expansion, and this brought Homo ergaster into other parts of the world, into Eurasia. He went into Asia, and Homo ergaster went also into Europe. And when they moved into these areas there were no other kinds of humans living there they were the first kinds of humans and when they moved into asia homo agasta evolved and became known as demisova man and when they moved into the middle east and europe homo agasta evolved and became known as neanderthal man and when they didn't move into asia or europe and when they just stayed put in africa they also, the Homo ergaster who stayed there also evolved. And who did he, that one evolved into? That evolved into us modern humans, okay? So Homo ergaster that remained in Africa evolved into Homo sapiens, okay? And those that went to Europe and Asia evolved into Neanderthal and Denisova, respectively. Now that multi-regional hypothesis comes from this ancient uh, from this ancient um, migration of Homo ergaster. The multi-regional hypothesis says that the humans that we find in the different parts of the world are related to the original Homo ergaster migrations two million years ago. Okay? And even though they might have been a recent out of Africa, the of modern humans out of Africa more recently they did not they mixed a little bit with these ancient populations but actually the different human populations we see today for example different we have Africans uh, Europeans and Asians those are the three main um, human populations we see today those populations evolved from the original uh, Homo ergaster uh, migration so in other words uh, in Europe, people would have evolved from Neanderthals. In Asia, people would have evolved from Denisova. And in Africa, people evolved from Neander uh, uh, Homo sapiens sapiens. So that is the multi-regional hypothesis, right? That basically modern humans actually are, are arisen from the original home, mainly arisen from the Homo agaster uh, migrations from two million years ago. So that's the multi-regional okay 
So even though humans left, we know that humans left Africa, modern humans, not Agastya now, modern humans left Africa 60,000 years ago, the multi-regional is saying that didn't have an effect, okay? The human populations today we see are descended from the home, uh, original Homo Agastya populations that left Europe, that left Africa and went to Europe and to Asia, okay? Then the out of Africa hypothesis says no, that's not what happened. What it could be that Agasta left, may, uh, created on the other side Denisova and Neanderthals, and in and modern humans um, evolved in Africa only. But the out of Africa hypothesis says the modern humans that evolved in Africa, they left Africa sixty thousand years ago, okay. But they didn't mix with the Agasta, the, the Denisova and the Neanderthal that they found there. They replaced them all. There was no mixing between the modern humans and the Neanderthals. That is what out of Africa, number one, is saying. Okay, That modern humans evolved in Africa and 60,000 years ago modern humans left Africa when they arrived in Eurasia, they, they saw Neanderthal and they saw Denisova, but they didn't mix with them. They just simply replaced them. Okay? They replaced them completely. So the difference between multi-regional and, and out of Africa are quite different, right? Multi-regional says the original migration two million years ago of Homo agaster, not modern humans. Modern humans didn't exist in that, that time, right? So Homo agaster evolved moved out of Africa about two million years ago and then settled down in Europe and in Asia, created Neanderthal and created Denisova and the Neanderthal evolved into white Europeans and Denisova evolved into Asians like Chinese and so on. And in Africa, modern humans, the African people evolved from Hagasta here that, that simply evolved into modern Africans. That's the multi-regional, right? Out of Africa says, sure, that could have happened, but the modern humans that evolved in Africa, those ones left Africa again more recently, 60,000 years ago. And those ones replaced those Denisovas and Neanderthal they found on that side. Okay? There was no mix. So the modern humans are not descended from those Denisovas and Neanderthals, like the multi regional says. The, the, the out of Africa says the modern humans, all humans are descended from Africans very recently, 60,000 years ago. Okay, so those are the two hypotheses um, of human phylogeography. Okay, and here they are in, in, uh, in um, figures. Right, this figure is multi-regional. This figure here with my mouse, as you see, is out of Africa. Multi-regional says Homo erectus, uh, what I'm calling Homo agaster, evolved here, okay? And uh, or about two million years ago, he leaves Africa. Here, he evolves in Africa. This is Africa, okay? He leaves Africa and goes into the rest of the world, okay? And the modern humans that you see today in Europe, Asia, are actually descended from those those original there could be some mixing with other humans that have come more recently okay but the, all the humans are descended from this two million year old leaving of africa okay that's multi-regional and here it says what yes multi-regional happened two million years ago but what happened to all of them they died out they died out no nah? They didn't make it to the present. They died out. And who are the people then that are living there? They came from Africa very recently, 60, 100,000 years ago. They left Africa and they replaced everyone. Okay? So this is out of Africa, a more recent origin for humanity. Whereas multi-regional gives a, a more ancient origin for humanity. Okay? Those are the two uh, human phylogeographic hypotheses. All right. And this is supported um, out of Africa supported by the fact that mitochondrial DNA of humans coalesces to about 150 to 200,000 years ago so to about this time here to about this time all human mitochondrial DNA is related to about this time here and so based on mitochondrial DNA it's supporting the out of Africa hypothesis
axis, okay? But in the meantime, since those two early hypotheses and mitochondrial DNA studies, they have become, they've now got whole genome studies, okay? And not just whole genomes of modern day animals, whole genomes, what does paleo mean? I told you it's from the old days, right? So paleo climate means climate of the old times. And so paleogenomics means genomics from the old times. So you take a fossil and you get the DNA out of the fossil and you sequence it and you sequence its genome and you've got a paleo genome. And so that is exactly what we have been able to do. So we've sequenced our human DNA, okay? That's from Homo sapiens here. But what were we able to also do? We were able to sequence the DNA of Neanderthal man and the DNA of Denisovan man. So here is a map of the world. Here is a map of Africa. And they said, and, and here is a new hypothesis for human phylogeography. Okay, see the blue here is representing the range of Neanderthal. And the red here is representing the range of Denisova. And the gray is representing the spread of Homo sapiens from Africa into the Eurasia. So basically out of Africa into Europe and into Asia, you see the arrows going, right? So that happened. We left Africa about 200,000 years ago or, or eight, around 100,000 years ago, just after we left Africa and we spread to in these two directions from Africa. Okay, but who did we meet? We did we meet Neanderthal when we arrived here, and did we meet Denisova when we arrived in Asia? Okay, we are now able to sequence the whole genome of Neanderthal and Denisova man. Okay, and that new data helps to resolve human phylogeography once and for all. And what it turns out to be was the multi regional correct? was the out of Africa correct? Which hypothesis was correct? Neither was correct. Neither was correct. What we are discovering now is actually that our own history involves mixing of human beings with Neanderthal and Denisova. Okay? There was mixing between... So when we left Africa, we went into Eurasia, there we met Neanderthal man. See where my arrow is? And there we met Denisova man here. And what happened? Here's the Denisova and Neanderthal form a sister group according to their genomes. And they have a common ancestor with Homo sapiens. Something before 500,000 years ago. Okay? All three of these species branching from the main Homo erectus lineage. Okay? So Homo erectus gave rise to both modern humans, Neanderthals and Denisova. Okay, Neanderthals and Denisovans left Africa. So multi-regional was correct in that, that Agasta left Africa and settled in Europe, became Denisova and Neanderthal. Then what happened when we left? We did not just replace them, as Out of Africa says. And these people who left Out of Africa were not simply replaced by the people who were already there, as multi-regional says. What happened was a combination of both out of Africa and multi-regional. It's called out of Africa with assimilation. What happened is we left Africa, we met Neanderthal, and what happened? We had gene flow with them. Okay? We mated with them. And we, we took our genes into their genes into our population. And our genes went into their population. And the same with Denisova. We met him here and we bred with him. Okay? So Asians living in Asia have some proportion of Denisova in their genomes. A small proportion, 1 to 2%. Europeans living in Europe, white people, have a small proportion of Neanderthal inside their genome. Between 4 and 6%. Okay? Or between 2 and 6%. Okay, but Africans living in Africa have no proportion of Neanderthal and Denisova. Okay, and that is telling us very clearly that Africans in the modern times evolved here. Modern, uh, modern humans evolved in Africa, left Africa ar uh, around 60, 90,000 years, 100,000 years ago. When they met Neanderthal, they bred with him. 
they exchanged genes with him. They didn't replace him, and he didn't replace them. They bred with each other. They assimilated the populations. And the very same, they left Africa, went to Asia. They didn't uh, replace Denisova. Denisova did not replace them. What happened? They bred with Denisova and created Asian people. Okay. And so this is what the out of Africa with the simula assimilation looks like. Sure, there is an ancient migration of Homo agaster out of Africa into the rest of the world. And then there is a second migration of modern humans out of Africa into the rest of the world. And there's some, you see, these lines here from the multi-regional, they do not die there. They feed faintly into the lines of humans that are inhabiting the rest of the world. But there's no faint contribution, no gene, there's faint gene flow, you see here, faint. But there's no gene flow between these guys and Africans. Because Africa did not, African people who remained, modern Africans who remained in Africa here, they did not encounter the genes of these guys here that left Africa before. It's only in Europe and in Asia you find proportions of the genome of those Europeans and Asians have some part of Homo, in ancient Homo agaster genome in them. Africans do not. Okay, so the fact that the greater diversity in Africa means out of Africa is true, this out of Africa model is true, but with assimilation, okay? Some genes from the ancient agaster migration from before made it into these populations. A small proportion, but it made it in. So Europeans have some N N Neanderthal inside them, and Asians have some Denisova inside of them. Okay? So this combined evidence now favors basically both multi-regional and out of Africa were true. Okay? Multi-regional was true. Humans did leave early and make other populations in the rest of the world. Out of Africa was true. Modern humans did arrive out of Africa. But they did not just simply replace the old ones. They assimilated the genes from the old ones into the new population. And that is the um, final word on human um, phylogeography. Okay, and we'll leave the phylogeography lecture there. Um, and we'll start with the last two lectures of the module um, next time.